Hi guys, how you doing? Welcome along to the High Performance Living Podcast. Well, no messing about today because I have a fantastic guest on the end of the line who I know is going to share some from unreal information with you guys. Without further ado, I have the mountain dog himself, Mr. John Meadows on the other end of the line. Are you there, man? I am. How's it going? Yeah, fantastic, buddy. Fantastic. How's things? I can't complain. Life is good. Probably working a little too much, but I guess that's uh, better than the alternative. So kids are keeping me busy. Jobs are keeping me busy. And um, life is good. Yeah, well, you're certainly a busy man. I seem to see you popping up over social media and on article websites and YouTube and all these other places. So you're, you're getting out some fantastic content and information, which is why it's been an absolute honor. And I'd like to say a huge thank you for coming on today and spending the time letting us answer or get a lot of questions answered, hopefully, if we can get through it in time. So for those who don't know you, John, introduce yourself a little bit more tell us what you do for example you said you're busy your background and well what are you most passionate about all right okay i think i'm gonna sit up i think my back's feeling better now (laughs) so first of all i have an achy back today because i'm an old man 42 (laughs) but uh i um i started uh training uh really hard when i was 13 and i just always enjoyed working out I thought it was great had a lot of fun Um, you can probably tell by my videos I still enjoy it I still love it Um, going through school I was you know the typical typical athlete I was in football and track and wrestling and all that good stuff and I really enjoyed football honestly I, I loved football I just wasn't good enough to play it at a really high level so I had to find another sport, um, you know, something competitive that I could uh, continue uh, continue doing once I got out of school. Um, I did I did go to college and get an undergrad degree. I, you know, I, I caught a bit of the lazies in college. I was I was pretty excited and pretty fired up to go to college and, and get a degree. And I started out in pre medicine, and I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon and work on knees. And honestly, every year that went by, I just got more and more lazy, and I ended up just getting a degree in health and fitness management. I had actually taken all the classes that were required to uh, be a physical therapist and and actually some other things, but um, I just kind of lost my way there for a little bit, and you know, all I really wanted to do was was train and eat (laughs) and train and eat. And so I didn't quite get the level of education that I, you know, looking back, I wish I would have mm-hmm. uh, followed through on. But, um, you know, I was competing back then, even. And, you know, I was a poor kid in college. I remember dieting back then on cans of tuna and lettuce. Mm-hmm. And um, it wasn't fun. <laughs> it wasn't fun at all. <laughs> it was pretty brutal. But, um, you know, so I competed through the years, and into the 90s, I uh, started competing in pro qualifiers in the late 90s. Um, my first ever top five placing was actually 1999, so you know, we're talking 15 years ago. Uh, I did get a job in the corporate world, and I think many of your listeners will probably be surprised to know that I worked at a bank for 12 years. And, you know, working at, working at a bank was, was really good for me because it gave me structure, number one. And, uh, you know, for me, um, bodybuilding success had a lot to do with structure. You know, you, you, you just become like a machine. Mm-hmm. You eat at a certain time, you go to work, you take a break, you know, have a protein shake, have your lunch. You know, you get home. Everything was very regimented. For years of my life, it was very regimented, and um, that was fine with me. I didn't mind that at all. You know, I kind of cringe nowadays when I hear people talk about how you shouldn't be regimented or any of that. It depends on the person. You know, some people do need to be regimented. Maybe some people don't. But some people do. Mm. And I was just one of those people back then, and I really did. So, 
I did well in the banking world, and what I did specifically, uh, people think you know I handled money and things like that. I actually ran projects. Um, and I, I worked for Chase Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, and I ran some of <clears throat> some of the big, biggest projects they had. Um, probably the biggest one was you know you go to a branch, uh, you know a banking branch, and you hand them checks or whatever. Yeah. You know, they're going to scan your check. They're going to, you know, you're going to stand in the teller line. They're going to scan your check. Then there's some things that happen to your check, capturing micro lines and all kinds of data. And then that data gets sent to other banks. Anyways, those teller systems deploying those all across the banking network um, was a big pro was a big project I had. It was it was about five thousand branches. It was a three year project, and you know I didn't realize it at the time, but it was giving me the skills to be able to handle a large workload in what I do now. Because mm. if you really think about it, there's a lot of similarity. You know, I'm handling large amounts of data. And the way I do people's programs, I'm very detailed. I track their, every change they make. Um, so you have to be efficient. Mm -hmm. You have to be real efficient where you get behind and you get lost. And you, you kind of catch yourself wondering what the person was doing. So it's important that you track those things. So I became very good at handling a large amount of data. Um, you know, I think when I worked in the banking industry, I didn't have any special skills. I think I was just good at pulling people together and building good teams. Mm. And having social skills is pretty important in coaching as well because you obviously interact with people. And if you're a jerk, you probably aren't going to be very busy. Sure. Uh, people want to, people won't like working with you. So, you know, I continued to work at the bank and uh this whole time I was coaching people behind the scenes. I didn't handle a lot of people, you know, maybe thirty people here, forty people there. But um I was so busy I never really got out on uh forums or, you know, when social media became big. I didn't really I wasn't I was just so busy I didn't have time for any of that. And, you know, I, I, as I was approaching 40 years old, I thought to myself, I need to make a decision now and start doing more coaching and kind of follow through with what I love or just not do it, mm -hmm. just compete myself, but don't do any coaching at all. And, you know, as much as I loved working at the bank and I miss the people, my heart was really into coaching. So I, um, I said goodbye to the bank. Um, I put in a 30-day notice, and I worked all 30 days. And, uh, you know, if you work in the banking industry, they usually walk you out the door that day. Right. So I had a real good relationship with those folks. I left. And, you know, then I, I got the chance to, you know, as you mentioned, become more active in social media. And that was important because I really wanted to share my ideas. Mm. And, you know, it gave me a chance to share my ideas and, uh, and so forth and do things like that. So I was... Um, it got you know I got busier and busier and busier and then poof here I am today. So, yeah, yeah. You know, so here we are. Awesome, mate. You and I actually share quite a similar story, and I actually got educated and went on to work in the construction industry before actually becoming a trainer and coach myself. So I did the whole sort of education system. Didn't really know what I wanted to do with you know my life really. To be honest with you, uh, started working for, as an engineer in an engineering. Uh, construction company did around about maybe not quite as long as you did in the bank but around about four or five years working as a surveyor you know out in out in the field every day and I realized just like yourself that when I was stood at work or as a surveyor all I was thinking about when my next meal was and what I was going to train that night and that's where I just started very similar to yourself doing a little bit of part-time stuff getting involved in social media dabbling my feet and I too decided, right, this is what I want to do with my life and I'm going to pursue it. So I, I actually really connect with you on that. And um, one question I wanted to actually talk to you about on that note was, how did you find that transition? Because I know personally that even in my short time span, working four or five years, you know, as a engineer, mm -hmm. actually... That was my wife in the back. I know, I know, I saw her. Yeah, she gave me a All smile. Right. So I sort of said hello, hello. <laughs> So 
I wanted just to kind of look at how did you find that transition? I find it very, very difficult going from an engineer stood outside all day with the guys, you know, on site to then sat in my office, as you can see now, on my own, talking to people on a computer <laughs> and having no going from that structure when I was told I was allowed a break to actually going, shit, I'm going to have a break when I feel like it. How have you yeah. found that and how have you dealt with that if you've had a similar situation? Man, I'll tell you, I will never forget mm. the first. After I resigned and I worked my 30 days, I will never forget that first Monday morning. You know, I'm used to the alarm waking me up, getting up, mm. and all of a sudden I wake up, and I'm like, okay, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do I do? You know, it, it was such a, such a different feeling. It was just really bizarre. And in a way, it was so ingrained in my head to be a kind of a corporate worker I almost felt like I was unemployed. Yeah. yeah. It was really weird. Um, it was, it was, you know, when you do something for so long, um, it was, it was a, I'm not going to say it was an easy transition because it was kind of, you know, it was like, well, what do I do? How? All that structure that I craved was now gone. Yeah. It was like, okay, what time is lunch? Well, it's whenever I want to eat lunch. Mm. And now that sounds good, but, a few years yeah. ago, it almost kind of scared me because it was it I, I, just that loss of structure. And I guess I just, I, I guess mentally I wasn't ready for that because I didn't implement any kind of new structure. I just wanted to do whatever. I'm like, I'm tired of getting up early in the mornings. I'm going to sleep when I want to sleep. I'm going to do what I want to do. So I didn't really want a structure at that point. But the downside of that was it was really bizarre. You know, and I, um, you know, and I, I'm a conservative person by nature, so, you know, I have a family to care for. I have, you know, two young boys, mm -hmm. a wife, and so, you know, leaving a good corporate job with a nice salary, nice benefits, was hard because I'm leaving for the unknown, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. I know that I have this. I don't really know what I have over here, so there was some financial um, questions in my head. Is this... Is this a good move? Is this the right move? So I really, I really struggle with that too. Yeah. You know, if probably if I didn't have a family, it would have been a little easier decision. But when you have other people come into play, you know, then it becomes, oh man, you know, what if this doesn't go well? You know, again, I'm a conservative person by nature, so, you know, I'm imagining all these worst case scenarios. Well, what if this? What if that happens? And you know, but I worked through it and um, figured out a game plan on how I could be happy and not worry about those things and I'm glad I did but but to your point though it was a very different transition mm, yeah you yeah. Know. yeah well it, that's I suppose that you know what like you're saying when you, you lose that structure you've got that family to look after uh, and you're essentially self-employed then that's what gets you out of bed in the morning at the end of the day you know that's still what gets you out of bed and that's what gets you at your desk may it be at a home at your office keeps you working hard and uh, I was exactly the same. I had to really, I think the financial side of things is is the key component, isn't it? And it's, you know, I had to sell my car. I had to, had to give away the salary. I had to sell my flat. And I moved in with actually a flat share, you know, with a bunch of random people, you know, three or four of us stuck in a house together. I didn't know them, but that's all I could afford for me to, you know, basically get my own coaching up and running. Thankfully, it's paying off and I'm not longer in that situation. But, you know, that's the sacrifices we've made. And I think... That brings us a little bit on to bodybuilding, another topic that you and I have probably a lot in common in that we've made a lot of them sacrifices over the years anyway, haven't we? And it kind of, when it came to changing your career and changing your lifestyle, it probably, as much of a big deal as it was, we've made them sacrifices before and we can transition that into our life. So let's, let's talk about bodybuilding then, move it on a level. I've actually competed, John, as a, as a natural bodybuilder a number of times. And uh, it, it, it is a passion of mine. I, I think it's a fantastic sport. I have a huge, huge respect for the competitors. I haven't taken it to the level that you have. And I know that's one of your personal focuses is competitive bodybuilding at the, uh, you know, at the top level. I'm sure a lot of listeners know that you do com competitive bodybuilding. And I know that although you haven't earned your pro card, I'd probably be not the only one to say that we probably consider you as a pro in our eyes. So... What's a week's what 
what's your current bodybuilding outlook at the minute and is your training and competitive mind on gear for that still is that still something you're doing yeah you know i'm actually seven weeks out from a contest right now i um i generally compete once a year that's that's about all i can handle mentally and you know when you compete you you do have to make some sacrifices you know like with your family and i'm not saying you you forget all those things but you do have to make some sacrifices and i'm at this point in my life i don't want to give all those things up all year and be one of these people that competes all year mm -hmm. it's just not my preference but um sorry we have people out front mowing it'll go away here in a little yeah bit. that's cool um so you know i i like to compete once a year because i i number one i i still have the my body hasn't quite gone downhill yet and I always said to myself I'll do it as long as I'm improving but once I start regressing and going backwards that's that's going to be the time to say okay I've had enough I know a lot of people say that then they keep on competing and they look worse and worse and worse and I pray that I'm not one of those people um, <clears throat> because I feel like if I'm improving I'm learning I can I can take I can take those things and I can pass them on in my, in my training you know, I'm always always building new training programs for clients. Always doing that. So as I'm doing this stuff and I'm learning, it's not just for me. You know, there's a, there's a secondary benefit to to my clients and my business. And you know, so that part, I'm always really excited about that part. Mm. Um, you know, I I would say the other thing is in terms of uh, in terms of bodybuilding, it's I never really liked, uh, you know, kind of the stage part of it, the um, the tanning and the oil and all that the stuff. The shaving. I never enjoyed that stuff, so it's not like I can't wait to do that and I can't wait to, uh, you know, go through that phase. So, but the it's one the... thing that hasn't changed since I was 13 years old was that training. Okay. And, um... To this day, I, I love pushing myself as, uh, you know, just like I did when I was younger. The difference is, as you get older, you know, and this is, and this is, these are things that I put in my training routines. You have to really be cautious about how you train. Mm -hmm. um, you got to be careful about your, the, you know, this huge emphasis on progressive overload. When you know, when you're 42 years old, if your sole driver is progressive overload. I'm going to tell you to start a clock because it's only a matter of time before you suffer a major injury. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you, you have to really adjust things as you get older in your training age. Uh, the sequence of your exercises, you know, rep schemes. So for me, I'm always, you know, some of the videos you've seen, uh, we were probably doing some pretty intense stuff. So for me, it's, you know, to generate hypertrophy, maybe I can't always add weight to the bar, but there are many other ways many other high intensity techniques that you can add to your program to keep you growing and that's kind of my specialty that's what I really love yeah that's what yeah. I've noticed I've spoke about your ten your training techniques on the podcast to guys before because uh, my main field is nutrition so learning from people like yourself is is really key what I picked up from you and as you've already highlighted is the intensity man the intensity in those sets is is brutal and it's where I've watched and went you know what, I can really take my own training to the next level now because this guy has just shown me that I was training like a pussy before. Do you know what I mean? And uh, that is something I've read into your work lately is kind of the the layer system that we, you would use quite a bit. So looking at pre-pumping the muscle group, doing some heavy work, uh, low rep stuff, post-pumping it, and then maybe doing some sort of explosive work on top of that. And I have found that to be one of the most effective training protocols that I, I've ever come across. And it's like you said, it's kind of like the principles and guidelines and being able then to join in the exercises to fit them in as you need according to that, that protocol that you've come right. up with. And then it, allows it, it makes it versatile for everybody. As long as you know the objective of that exercise or of that, how it positioned in your workout, you can kind of match it to you and what works yeah. works best for you in terms of exercises. Because we know that a barbell curl for the biceps mightn't pump the biceps as well for you as it might I 
or somebody else. So it's actually matching the exercises. How did you come up with that kind of system in terms of the layers and actually getting it in order where it actually works phenomenally well? You know, that's, um, I hear people talking about, uh, this science versus art thing. And this is, this is the best combination I can think of science and art, um, where you kind of join the two together. You know, that first phase, always the pre-pump phase, and for your listeners that maybe aren't quite sure what we're talking about, a, hmm. a pre-pump exercise is an exercise that is meant to basically drive muscle into the blood, or uh, drive blood into the muscle, but not traumatize your joints. So, for instance, if you were training chest, you might do a machine press, or you might do a dumbbell press. But you wouldn't load a heavy barbell up and do bench presses out of gates. You pump the muscle, you get it full of blood, and it's it serves as two purposes. It serves as kind of um, I, I don't like the word pre-exhaust because it's not a true pre-exhaust. It's more of a it prepares you for heavier loads. But there's another thing going on there. Uh, you mentioned nutrition. Training and nutrition have to complement each other. You know, and I see people who, you know don't really get that they talk about you know this is how you should train well how should you eat well it doesn't matter just train this way it actually does matter and the way that I set up nutrition um, you know you have some you know you have some things in your blood that you want to drive right into the muscle so we're kind of encouraging this uh, delivery of nutrients into the muscle during that phase as well um, I think you've probably heard me talk about casein hydrolysates and I'm a big you know, fan these of these are yeah. yeah. Yeah, these are these are broken down proteins, diantripeptides, and then also carbohydrates that are low osmolarity. Um, I found that those type of carbohydrates do really well. They don't upset people's stomach. Um, it really, really the insulin response you get from that really helps to manage muscle protein breakdown and, and actually even cortisol. But so you kind of prepare the muscle and then when you do a basic exercise, um, your body is your body is more ready for it. Mm. Uh, whether it's a squat or I'm a big I like incline bench presses as well. It's one of my favorites. Done on a kind of a slight incline, not a real high incline. But so then you're kind of prepared for those. And the other thing we like to do is we like to do them. Um, we like to do those reps explosively. So it's not like you know I used to train at Westside Barbell and we would take. 55% of our max on the bench and do really, really fast sets of three with it. It's not that light and explosive. Um, but you want to press as hard against the bar as you can, for example, and re really try to, you know, engage your every single motor unit you can engage. It's uh, really, you know, driving the bar hard. Um, you know, you've also got to learn stability and keep tight and all that good stuff. But so you think you get a little bit of heavier loads um, out of the way, you know, and that's when, and then after that is when we typically add in all the really high intensity stuff, the drop sets, the mm -hmm. partials, supersets, and all those kinds of things. And, and there we're just literally trying to pump the muscle to the max. Yeah. And that's literally it. And, you know, so you've, you've kind of prepared a muscle, you've hit it with some pretty decent weight. But you didn't really tear your joints up because we're not doing doubles, triples, singles. Yeah. We're also yeah. using weight that we can move fast. We don't do grinders where you can just barely, barely get the weight up. Um, and then that third phase. So now you've done those two things. Now your muscle's pumped. It's engorged with blood. And then we like to go into this fourth stage where um, we work the muscle, I always say, from a stretch position. And... You know, like let's say your hamstrings are really pumped. A stiff leg of deadlift fits into mm. this. Let's say your chest is really pumped. A really strict fly. Mm. Um, so something uh, of that nature. You know, in terms, you asked me how I kind of built that. The, the first phase was kind of to avoid getting injured. Okay. Then the second phase was, well, you know, okay, so I, I prepared the muscle. I'm a power lifter at heart, so I couldn't give up those exercises. Yeah. I had to find a way to do those exercises heavy, but intelligently though. So that part of me wasn't going anywhere. And 
there's also a bodybuilder to me that likes to just engorge the muscle with blood, you know? So it's like, okay, well, let's try this here. And, you know, what I always found was for recovery, that last phase seemed to always help with recovery. Okay. Uh, you know, the stretch, working on muscle from a stretch position. So it made sense. It made sense to finish a workout with that, you know? Now, these aren't kind of hard and fast rules. Sometimes I change it. But generally speaking, 80% of the time, that's what we do. And I played around with it. I moved to different phases around, done different things. Yeah. And it's just what I found works best for most people. It's I'm not going to sit here and tell you it works best for everybody because you may take that second exercise and you may put it third and feel it even more in the muscle. Mm-hmm. Heck, you might even put a – you might even – you know, put a stretch exercise up a little higher if you pump up real quick. You know, so depending on your own physiology and how you react to training, you can kind of play around with that. Awesome. Love you know, that, mate. So. Yeah. It's something I've had a lot of success with. Still use it in my own training. And uh, just wanted to check you're still doing it so I can keep going. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I'm always looking, you know, the, the high intensity stuff is very interesting to me because. I, you know, what I like to do is I like to get these guys that are really advanced. Mm-hmm. Guys that you think, man, how in the world am I going to add another ten pounds of muscle to this guy? <laughs> this is the way to do it. I mean, I, it really is. Yeah. Because you know, if you think about drugs, well, they're still using the same drugs. If they're natural, they're still going to be natural. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't just force food down somebody and make them magically gain ten or twenty pounds. Mm-hmm. I think that stimulus is what makes a difference. In the more advanced somebody gets the more kind of creative you got to get with that stimulus because your body adapts so well. And the, and the more and more advanced you get, whether you're natural or not, your body gets better and better and better and better at adapting to whatever you throw at it. So another thing that you may not have seen is I've been taking um, some of the high-intensity techniques and doing two, three weeks with them, usually two weeks. Like let's say we're using drop sets yeah. a lot. I might only do drop sets for two weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, then the next uh, two weeks, we might do uh, partial, a lot of partials. So, I'm, you know, I'm seeing a lot of positive results with this, too. You know, it, it seems like even the really high-intensity stuff, you got to kind of cycle in and out and change. Okay, that's a great point. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's something I haven't thought about. So you're actually just rotating, cycling this drop sets, you know, 21s, you name it, bands. Probably bands and chains probably fall into that. Would it be right? Yeah, you know, bands are tricky because bands are, um, they're addicting in a way because, like, if you think about a chest press with bands, you think about the contraction you get, mm. it's awesome. Yeah. You know, you think about a banded leg press. The first time you ever do that, it's awesome. But one thing I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt is you can overdo bands mm. when it comes to pressing. Um, Okay, that's my dog barking. <laughs> I have a very big dog. Yeah. It's a Bernese mountain dog, too. I like it. Uh, um, so bands are a double-edged sword. You know, we um, I learned this the hard way. You know, this feels great, so I'm going to do it every week. <laughs> Seven weeks later, my elbows hurt, my knees hurt. I drop the bands, and boom, they're good again. Yeah. So I try to tell people, don't use them more than two weeks in a row and just kind of sprinkle them in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, I'm not talking about reverse bands, but I'm talking about where you're pressing against the band. Um, and then chains, man, I love chains. I, lo- I love chains. Um, just the simple concept of making the weight heavier as you get stronger makes a lot of sense to me in terms of pure intensity. So I, I do try to use as many a chain. I try to use as chain work as much as I can mm-hmm. that's something that I'd never felt hurt my joints or overtrained me or which is interesting because chains in a lot of ways to me is the most intense thing you can do because yeah. it, if you're using them right at no point in the exercise is it easy it shouldn't be if you're using them right um, you know so um, again I, I don't I wouldn't say use them 12 weeks in a row but this whole concept of kind of sprinkling this stuff in, not doing it longer than two weeks, it's really helping. And it's helping um, people. I've always had people tell me that their joints feel better than they've ever felt. It's getting even better now. Good. It's yeah. getting even better now, now that we're learning a little bit more. So so this, um, this refinement is, I'm always thinking about this stuff. You know, I write, I write programs 
I'm constantly writing programs, um, constantly. I never stop. And every time I do one, I like to think that I've kind of figured something out. I might not be able to prove it, but it, it seems this way. And then I let people try it, and I tell people, well, hey, what would you think about that? And, you know, nine out of ten people will say, you know what, I really like that. You know, then I might have that one person say, well, it didn't work well for me. I liked it the way you did it before. Yeah. But, you know, it's this never-ending search for uh, the perfect program. Always, mate. Yeah. When, when it might not be out there, right? Yeah. And, you know, you made a good point earlier. I, I don't, I really don't expect. What I like more than anything is when somebody does this stuff and they say, I've learned how to use your system and adjust it to me. Because that's really the key. You know, person A and person B are going to be a little different. So if you can take, take you know, some of the things in my program and the structure of the workout or the way we do things and make your workouts better, that's what it's all about. Yeah. You yeah. know, so... I always I say. Get people that are, go ahead. Sorry, I say. I always say if a client has worked with me for six, twelve months, and at the end of it, they they still email me after twelve months and say, "Hey, Rue, can you update my nutrition plan?" I've failed because I haven't been able to instill what I know onto them to be able to do it themselves. So I want after the you know X, how long you're working with that client to be able to go right. I'm good to go, Rue. Thanks very much. I'm able to handle this myself, and that's six. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't right. Let's cover quickly a little bit about nutrition before we go. Okay. As we've just talked about training, it's it's hard to recover from that style of training. So we need a big diet, right, to to support that, recover from it, grow, all the rest of it. What's your typical recommendations for diet? You covered a little bit around about workout nutrition there, your case and hydroslides, your Pepto Pro stuff, in with your um, cyclic dextrins. What happens then outside of this workout window then? How do you tend to structure a diet? Well, you know, the number one thing is, um, you know, you look at the person's goals and some people are going to want to lose fat. Um, you know, they may be in a contest. Some people maybe will are just going to want to gain muscle and even if it means gaining a little bit of fat with it. So, you know, you look at the person's goals you look at their history and you try to get an idea of where they're at metabolically, you know, how much are they able to eat. Um, but I start, I, I always start with the period workout. What are you doing pre enter and post? Because the beauty of that um, is, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about there's no window for this stuff. You know, they're, <clears throat> I, I believe that they're looking at a piece of the puzzle and not the whole puzzle they're looking at protein synthesis. And protein synthesis is, I couldn't agree more, it's absolutely turned on for 24, 48 hours, whatever it is. I agree with those folks. But there's another layer to this that nobody talks about. You know, and when it comes to growth, you know, it's part of that equation, muscle protein synthesis minus muscle protein breakdown, uh, hopefully is a positive number. If you have more muscle protein breakdown than you, than you do synthesis, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to go backwards. So I'm a big fan of managing muscle protein breakdown while it happens. Uh, just through the years, I've just found this is absolutely the best way that I know of. Right now, you know, maybe someday I'll find something new. But <clears throat> when you um, manage muscle protein breakdown right out of the gate, right while you're training, it's important because it it also allows you to train more. Yeah. Um, and every time you train, even though training is inherently catabolic, every time you train, there's an anabolic opportunity. You're you're stimulating, you know, mTOR. Well, you know, there's all kinds of things going on to to put the wheels of growth in motion. Sure. Uh, per se. So we figure that out. We perfect that. And when I what I mean by perfect is I usually have people start at a certain amount of um, intro workout nutrition and I have them go by their soreness their recovery and I have them raise it until they're not really that sore anymore and that's when I know we've hit the jackpot it's like okay that's the dose we want and then beyond that those other meals if it's somebody you know the, the basic the basic is going to be protein obviously it's going to be in there if it's somebody that wants to gain muscle that has a good metabolism I'm probably going to also add carbs in those meals mm-hmm 
if it's somebody that's tightening down, maybe they're preparing for a contest, the further out away you get from the workout, the less carbs I'm going to have them eat. So, for example, let's say you train in the afternoon. And let's say you, at the end of your diet, moving, in your, moving into your pre-contest phase, you have carbs in every meal. Okay, then so the first step I'm going to take to get somebody lean is to take the carbs out of their first meal because it's furthest away from their workout. And I just keep, uh, I move from the outside in. I keep removing carbs until we get down to where the only thing left is the stuff around training. And usually at that point, they're pretty lean. Yeah. You know, it depends on a person, but if you methodically work through that part, they're pretty lean. Yeah. Um, and I found this approach works really well with natural folks too, really well, because the danger in training hard and doing cardio and possibly overdoing cardio for somebody who's natural is you don't have all the aids that the other guys have. You can lose muscle easy. Yeah. And if you lose muscle easy, there goes your metabolism. So by keeping carbs around training to help you train harder, by stimulating insulin while you train to help that breakdown so that breakdown doesn't get excessive, you know, I would make the case that it's even this this style of eating is is even better for naturals, you know, because you don't have the you know the the effects of gear and other things to help you with your recovery. Mm -hmm. So you know, I get asked that a lot, and I'm like, well, this actually this is better for naturals. Yeah. And you and that re this and you know the most bizarre thing to me is the whole recovery piece works just as well for naturals. I can train somebody who's natural with a workout, somebody who's not with the exact same workout. And as long as the guy who's natural is kind of mastered that period workout stuff, he can also conquer his soreness, just like the other guy. Yeah. And I that was a really hard thing for me to understand because I just thought, wow, I don't is it really that powerful? It really is. And I yeah. think in five to ten years you're gonna see a lot of people say, Hey, you know what? We should have thought about muscle protein breakdown more and slowing it down. You know, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, just, um, okay. I've heard a lot of people say, well, just don't train as hard. Okay, you tell me how that's going to put 10 pounds on that advanced athlete that's competing in the Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Well, just don't train as hard. That's not a good solution. <laughs> okay? Yeah. So hopefully you can kind of see, you know, kind of how all this stuff interrelates and how I think about it and, you know, it's all, it's all, um, it all ties together. Yeah, John, I absolutely love it. I love the, your, your sort of analogy on outlook on training and of course tying it into nutrition for recovery, but obviously health as well. Your key component on balancing the diet as much as you can for someone, aren't you, in terms of making sure that you're looking on the inside, inside out really and optimizing health before we can change the outside and and it's something i've always tried to reflect in my work as well so it's it's been an absolute pleasure i know you're a busy man so i think i'll let you get on and uh for those who want to find out more about your training nutrition uh, i know you've got a fantastic uh, membership site where can people get hold of you where's the best place um mountaindogdiet.com is where you'll find my website and if you don't remember that just google john meadows you won't have any trouble finding me at all. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on I'm on Instagram now. I'm on YouTube. I have a really cool YouTube channel actually. YouTube, yeah. Um, and my website. Um, I got about I'm I'm almost at two thousand members now. People love it. It's it's um, you know, for nine something a month, what I do is I have a workout of the month. Um, which allows people to kind of sample what I'm doing. And I, I've got over 40 of them on there now. So you've really got enough to kind of build your own program. I have advanced nutrition articles, mostly written by a couple of my friends that are PhDs that are also really good bodybuilders, just extremely, extremely bright guys. I pay them more so that they'll write for me and not the yeah. magazines. So you won't see them writing in magazines because I try not to let them. <laughs> I, pay, I pay them a lot more than the magazines pay them. Um, you, you'll find um, in the trenches case studies, I call them, where I take my competitors and I, and I detail out their diet to the T throughout their pre-contest prep. You know, And I've had a lot of other people who do what I do say, man, I can't believe you do that. You're giving everything away. Well, no, I'm not. Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. And not everybody can afford you know, to pay somebody to coach them. So this gives people, you know, they see 20, 30 people here. There might be somebody who they're 
you know, maybe they have some similarity with. And it'll give them some ideas on what they can do with their diet. I absolutely love that part of it. It's pros, amateurs, people who don't compete. Um, I just launched a, I just added on a novice part to it. Um, so, you know, folks who, do, who don't compete, who just want to see, you know, kind of some transformation type deals, what happens, I have those. Um, you know, I have a and a on there, and when people join, they can send me questions throughout the month, and I answer them. Yeah. There's just a ton of stuff on there. There really is. Yeah. And uh, people tell me all the time, man, I feel guilty. I feel like I should pay you more. And I'm like, that's okay. Uh, just stick around for a while, and, and I'll be happy. Cool. No, it's, um, I'm a member of it as well, and I can vouch for everything that you say, particularly the in the trenches stuff. It's a fantastic insight into what a lot of the top level guys are doing you know how you deal with these guys and putting like you said how do you put 10 pounds of muscle on these these big dudes already or how do you actually get these big guys or you know professional females into that sort of stage ready conditioning because it's no easy it's no easy thing is it and oh, you allow us to have a look and uh you know the, the articles that you have on there from scott and people like that who write for you unbelievable you know it's that it's the next level up that you would ever get from magazines or online magazine subscriptions you know free stuff so it is absolutely worth paying for so keep it up it's good work thank you you know the other thing is um the new website launches it's probably gonna launch in about two weeks now okay so um have you find that I'm, stressful yeah <laughs> <laughs> Websites, it is because yeah. there's so much I like about my norm, my my one now. Okay, yeah. You know, so I go in there and I'm reviewing with them every week, and I gotta go see them next Tuesday. I'm like, wait a minute, I wanted that to look the same. Yeah. I like the way that looked. Yeah. So it's <clears throat> going through with, a, I mean, fine tooth comb, going through everything. Yeah. Does this look, still look good? But there's a lot of things a new website will have though that I don't have now, like the search function, for example. Yeah. You know, people all the time say, I wish you had a search function, and I couldn't agree with them more. And so they'll have a search function, you know, so that they don't have to go through every single Q&A, yeah. Um, yeah. which would be, which is hundreds upon hundreds of questions. Um, so it's it's a definitely going to be an improvement. There's some visual stuff, too, I think you guys will like. Um, cool. Pretty cool visual stuff. But, um, yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that, too, actually. I love it, John. Well, thank you for taking the time out today. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, I'll let you. I'll let you go. I'll let you be. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, guys. I hope you've enjoyed today's show with John. Like I said, if you want to check out more of him, check out in Google John Meadows or Mountain Dog Diet, and I'm pretty sure you will be easily found. That's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed the show, and I'll speak to you same time next week. Until then, bye bye.